Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tricia Gordon. I'm at the University of Virginia, and I'm facilitating our teaching and learning call today. Thank you all for being here. Um, we are going to have Jolie Tingen and Sean Foster. Um, Jolie's at Duke, and Sean is at Western University presenting on uh, an interface guide for Sakai, and we'll launch into that in a few minutes after we go through some announcements. So I wanted to first open up and see if anybody has any announcements they'd like to share. Uh, hi, this is Neil. Before I share announcements, let me see who's on the call, because maybe somebody else will want to share first. Let's see. Is there anyone else before I launch into my laundry list? Looks like you're the big winner, Neil. All right. Um, All right. So um, let's see. A uh, bunch of stuff. Uh, Sakai uh, 12. Um, uh, it looks like the assignments tool is getting close to being done. We are starting on the, we've been doing, you know, um, easy QA and the QA kid kind of testing. Um, and we're now ready to launch into recruiting institutions and people to do release regression testing. And so if there was a possibility of having five minutes, um, you know, on the call to talk about what that looks like, that would be great if there's a way to squeeze that in. Um, okay. um, until mm -hmm. the end, if that's okay. And yeah. Then, no. Okay. Great. Wait yeah. till the end on that. Um, uh, so that's where that is. Uh, um, a couple of Aperio plugs. Um, uh, uh, Aperio is recruiting um, people to participate, to be mentors in incubation, and that may sound intimidating, but it's not. It's actually a way to get. Um, introduced to other other Aperio projects that are coming into the you know Aperio broader Aperio community and basically it's about asking questions and sharing what experience you've had in whatever um, you know Aperio communities you've been part of for many of us it's Sakai but not not necessarily exclusively that and um, so and that's a relatively small commitment from what I understand uh, and right, incubation is about creating a sustainable software community. So these are new projects that are becoming a Perio projects in process, and we want to help them to think through some things uh, for themselves that might, you know, help make them more sustainable and vibrant communities. So I, if you're interested in that, I really encourage you to explore it because it doesn't sound like it's a very big commitment, and it could be a very, very big value to the community and potentially a big value to any of us who participate. Um, in that, so please consider Quick that. Question, Neil. Mm -hmm. do, are you? Do you have any idea how much? Um, how many new projects are out there looking for mentors? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I can. I, I. For some reason, the number two is popping in my brain, but it, there may be others, and it may also be that there are others that are in progress that could that you know are still proceeding through incubation that could use it. So Laura says two to three. She might have a better okay. view on that. <laughs> Um, and everyone is qualified. That's right. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I'm qualified. Yeah, you are. So um, mm -hmm. uh, that's one plug. The other Aperio plug is for the Open Aperio, the, um, you know, our big conference every year, which is going to be in Montreal, uh, Quebec, which I know I'm pronouncing completely incorrectly. My daughter corrected me when I told her. Um, uh, and uh, but in any case, we need people on the planning committee. Thank you for for Laura. <laughs> uh, yeah, my my daughter's taking my daughter's taking French. So, um, yeah, so we need people on the planning committee. We're a little bit. We've got some really good people on there. Wilma's on there. Alan Reagan's on there. Ian's on there. I'm on there. I think there may be uh, one or two others. I'm not sure about, but so we 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 but we need more. You know, because it does take uh, takes a village to make that thing happen, and we also have you know great support from Concentra. Um, who's you know does a lot of a lot, a lot of the legwork um, for setting the conference up. So if you're that 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 is a bit of more of a commitment than, for example, incubation, but it's also something that's really needed. So if there's you have any, I forget if Sean you might be on there too. I I didn't get the whole list, but I'm just trying to remember what what I was 
heard. Um, in any case, could you definitely use more people? So please consider doing that. It's a, it's um, it'd be a huge help in uh, helping. What uh, kind of um, uh, activities might one anticipate if they're on this planning committee? Yeah, uh, I should have been able to anticipate that because uh, I've been part of the this committee. I think every year. Um, let's see. Uh, reviewing proposals or. There is reviewing proposals, and for that, we also um, sometimes make an extra call for people who the only way they can participate is by, you know, isn't that that particular angle. So yeah, we almost certainly will need additional people to review proposals, and we'll make a call for that. So that's something if you don't want to participate in the in the um, planning committee, you don't have the time, um, but could participate in some way, we will almost certainly need that. Um, we also think about things like um, logistics, um, scheduling, um, networking activities, what kinds of networking activities, what kinds of fun activities, that's a, a part of it, um, you know, uh, including things like um, the evening planning, right, so social stuff like that as well, um, the logistics of it, uh, yeah, so just a whole range of different um, activities that are, that are um, involved okay. there. All right, cool, thanks. Yeah. That's helpful. And every, every, you know, every person helps, really, and we get new ideas that way and so forth. So that's a little bit longer pitch. Um, so sorry if I took too, too much time on that. Um, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> okay, other than that, I mean, there are other things I could talk about, but I think uh, those are probably the main, main ones I had in my mind unless anybody okay. has other questions. Sounds good. Thanks, Neil. Um, so, oh, does anybody have a JIRA that they want to bring up for discussion before we launch into our main presentation? I did not plan. So if we, okay, that's fine. Neil, so we might have a couple minutes for, um, if you have any other announcements, if you want to um, plug them in, or if you want to talk about QA real quick, and right now we could do that. Okay. Um, well, you know, there, like I said, there are one, a couple of things that pop in my mind. One is there's a, uh, um, Sakai, um, a Sakai camp light, um, a regional Sakai camp and, uh, here in Durham, where I live, Duke hosted by Duke University, and we're going to have, you know, uh, probably about 13 to 15, around, you know, dozen people or so. And then we'll have um, at 10 a.m. Eastern, we'll have an NGDLE discussion. And there's um, so if people want to join that remotely, we'll have a remote option for people to join just that one piece at 10 a.m. a week from today. And if you're interested in that, oh, just okay. email. Yeah. And if you're interested in that, piece, email me, and I'm keeping a spreadsheet of the people who want or want to participate. So then when we have the logistics details, I can just email just those people. Okay. Um, so that occurred. And of course, there's other things going on, like Sakai virtual conference planning and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't think Wilma's on, and I can't think of any. Thank you, Laura. Hey. Yeah, 10 a.m. Wednesday on the 25th. Yep. Uh, Eastern. Um, I can't think of any specific announcements around the Sakai virtual conference, although if one was here, she might come up with some, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank okay. you, Neil. Sure. All right. So I think we are ready to launch into the presentation with Sean Foster and Jolie Tengen on creating an interface guide for Sakai. So I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you, Tricia. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah. OK, great. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we were invited by Matt back in June, at the end of June. And four months later, we're, event we're finally pre presenting. He had seen our presentation at Open Aperio. So we're going to be kind of walking through that presentation again. So I apologize in advance if, if other people were already there in a presentation in Philadelphia in June. Um, but what we're going to do also is uh, four months have gone by and some things have happened since then. So we're also going to include some updates on the project as well. So um, this is our uh, presentation from Open Apparel called Creating a Standard Visual Language for a Global Community. And I'm Sean from Western University. I'm Jolie from Duke University. And I guess we'll get started. 
hope this works. <laughs> so we just want to start by telling a bit of a story, and we'll, we'll start at the beginning. And according to uh, Chuck Severance, or Dr. Chuck's book, um, that he wrote about um, the, the history of Sakai and the starting part, um, when Sakai was formed in 2004, it was kind of formed by a best of breed combination of current software from the starter schools of Sakai, um, including Indiana, Stanford, Michigan, MIT, and from their different parts of their learning management systems that they had, which were mostly in-house things. And at the time, they used some innovative technology that is now completely outdated, but it's still there at the core. And those tools that they first started with um, were pieced together from tools that they had in their existing LMSs. One example of that is the Test and Quizzes tool, otherwise known as Samago, that came from Stanford's SAM, or the Stanford Assessment Module, and from uh, Indiana's Navigo project. So when they combined SAM with Navigo, it became Samago and the Test and Quizzes tool that we know today. And in, that, in this book, he talks about how after version 1 came out, they started working on version 2.0, which was released in June of 2005, and they were able to bring in gradebooks from Berkeley and MIT, and at the time, they created a style guide from the, by, um, that was worked on by the University of Michigan. And in, uh, since then, not a lot of work has been done to continue and to maintain this style guide. So that was 2004. And let's just think back for a second what 2004 was like. This is what Google looked like back then. This is what Amazon looked like back then. And if we look at the top there, you can see that uh, the Lord of the Rings had just, you can pre-order um, pre the DVD of uh, Return of the King. And this is what the Facebook looked like back then. It had just launched <laughs> around the same time. So this was a long time ago. This is 2004. And so a lot has changed. So. Um, since then, many people around the world and from different backgrounds and experiences have contributed to Sakai. And a lot of those initial elements and stuff that's been worked on since are still present in the current Sakai. And so we have this mix of interface and visual elements from the past dozen years. And those differences and inconsistencies affect the way the end users interact, um, when, uh, interact with Sakai when they're using the product. So this, this makes us think about UX, and we want to understand why UX matters. And so just for our background, UX, or user experience, is how a person feels when interacting with a digital product. And there's a number of factors that are, is incorporated into the user experience, and that includes usability, accessibility, performance of the system um, and their experience, design and aesthetics, utility, ergonomics, and overall human interaction with that product or that, um, that object. And uh, a well-known uh, author um, called uh, Donald Norman wrote a series of books, and this is um, one of his more famous ones, The Design of Everyday Things. It was written in 1988, but a lot of the um, stuff that he's written about still applies to things today, both in the uh, virtual world and in the physical world. And we can just look by looking at the, the cover here, you can see that that's not a very usable uh, teapot there with the spout on the right hand side right above where you're holding on to it. So in the book, he talks about how things can be designed to be more usable, um, but also to provide affordances and other elements to um, to design that um, can just make for a better experience. So one of the uh, examples that he uses throughout the book is door handles. And um, the door handle can be designed in one of two ways. Uh, it can be used as a plate, or, or sorry, designed as a plate or a button that can afford or present a way to push the door open, or it could be a bar or a handle that affords pulling. And those give you visual cues so that you know which way you need to open the door. And if you've ever run into a door when trying to open it, even ones that weren't locked, um, it usually happens because this affordance is incorrectly in communicating which way um, the, the door should be opening. So um, if you ever run into a door, it's probably because it's a plate that actually pulls open, but should be pushing open. So that's just an example from the book. But he goes on and coins the term user-centered design, and that is the design that um, is based on the needs of the user. 
So for instance, he, in the book, he outlines seven stages of action. And when we want to do something, when we want to do an action, we form a goal, we form an interaction to achieve that goal. We specify that action, we execute on that action. Then we perceive the state of the world and interpret whether or not our action has done anything. And then we evaluate the overall outcome. So one of the examples that he gives is about an, uh, an ancient technology from many, many, many years ago that some of you might not be even familiar with, the VCR. So example that he uses um, when is re recording with a VCR, which we all know can't, or for those who've used it, isn't always the easiest thing. But we press the record button. Sometimes you have to specify a time of the recording, which usually involves several steps, such as changing the hours and the minutes. You might have to change what channel you're recording on or, or what input, um, either by entering the numbers or using up and down arrows. And then you have some other settings that you have to press OK. So that's, that's that first part from my previous slide of forming the goal, specifying the action, and executing on it. And then you just let it record, and then afterwards you get to uh, review it to see if what your action did, did it actually record? Or, and then you evaluate the outcome. Oh shoot, I have recorded a different channel or the wrong time and I missed what, uh, what we're doing. So, uh, or what I wanted to record. So that's just one of the examples that he uses walking through those um, seven stages of action. Um, and so that's the type of thing that we need to think about when we're working on uh, our, our designs and our, our products and Sakai in general. He also talks about four main products of good design, and that includes visibility, a good conceptual model, good uh, mappings, and feedback. So visi visibility would be by looking at it, can the user tell what the state of the device is and what alternatives for action there are? A good conceptual model includes providing a good conceptual model for the user with consistency in the presentation of operations and results and a coherent and consistent system image. And we'll go back to that one in a second. And good mappings in, um, determine whether or not the relationship between the actions and the results are obvious, between the controls and the effects, and between the system state and what is visible. And lastly, the feedback, um, that's when the, it is about um, whether the user receives full and continuous feedback about the results of their actions. So as I said, I wanted to concentrate on the good conceptual model. And the part from what I just uh, said was that the consistency in the presentation of operations and results are, are co coherent and consistent. Um, and that, that is something that needs to take place across the whole um, uh, product or the whole system in order to create a consistency for the user so that they understand how things will react from what they've already in, uh, experienced. And so if we look at another quote, this is from um, Apple's um, hum, uh, Human Interface Guidelines from 1987. And uh, they knew this back then as well. The purpose of visual consistency is to construct a believable environment for users. The transfer of skills is, is one of the most important benefits of consistent interface, especially for beginner users. So somebody that is just starting out, if they start to learn something and then they go and um, try to apply that somewhere else, they, um, sorry, I'm just reading Laura's comment about breathing. <laughs> I'm probably going really fast here. Uh, uh, they they want to know that once they learn something in one part of the system that they can apply that somewhere else. So that brings us back to Sakai and consistency in Sakai. And the examples that I gave back in June were of the lessons tool. And um, I'm not trying to pick on lessons in particular. Just, it, it just turned out that it's, it's a really good example of, of consistency. So if we look at the top there, and the top left row, right under where it says lessons, we have an add content, uh, more tools, reorder, tips, and then a little gear icon. And what I asked the audience back in June was, for each of these buttons, um, to guess what um, what they do, and I gave them four options. Whether it was a drop-down menu, a modal window, a new page, or a new tab or window that would appear when they click on it. And it was surprising the results of this um, for people that are very comfortable with using Sakai, that from memory or from visual cues, it isn't obvious all the time to know what was gonna be launched from here. Since, for example, if we look at add content, if we click on that, and you think about those four options, drop-down menu, modal window, new page, or new tab and window. Um, 
what actually happens is that the ad content comes up in a modal window. Now, if we look at the more tools that has a similar uh, style of text and, and button size, but has a little drop down arrow beside it rather than a plus sign, and we get those four same options, drop down, modal, new page, or new tab. Um, when we look at what happens there with a different icon, we still get a modal window. So there's a bit of a visual difference there, but it gives us the same result. So that's a bit of an inconsistency. If we look at the reorder, it doesn't have a symbol next to the text, but the text is still there. And we get those same four options, drop down, modal, new page, new tab. And this time when we click on it, you get a brand, it takes you to a new page within that same window to reorder them with a full page reload. Lastly, or I guess next, if we look at tips, um, same four options. This time when we click on tips, it opens in a new tab or window. So that's opening a brand new window or tab. And lastly, this time we don't have any text, so it's different than the other ones, um, but it just has a, a symbol. So therefore visually it's different. Um, but when we click on that gear icon, which is for settings, we get a, a larger modal window. So it's very similar in action to the first um, two uh, buttons there, but visually they're different. So there's no consistency across there. So the user ends up guessing as to what will pop up in there. Now we can do the same exercise by looking in the top right hand corner with the print view, the index of pages, the link and the help. And we can have those same four options of drop down, modal, new page, new tab. And when we look at them, they all do slightly different things. Uh, even though they all visually look very similar with their icon on the left and their text and the similar shape buttons. So this is just an example of some inconsistencies that we already have in Sakai and how we need to standardize this to help with um, provide better affordance for the, the users to be able to better understand as they're learning and as they're interacting with the, the, um, the system to better understand what their actions are going to do. Another ex example of um, consistent inconsistency is between tools themselves. So that was the previous example with lessons was within the same tool on the same page, actually. This one is between different tools. So I'm going to be comparing assignments with the announcements tool. And if we look at how you remove uh, an item, so we're talking about the table in the bottom there where it starts with assignment title. And on the far right, we have a remove column with a check mark and remove with a question mark. And at the bottom, we have a remove selected button that is disabled um, when there's no selections. If we look at the same similar table to um, in, a, in the announcements tool, we again have a table. It has a remove with a question mark and a check mark. But this time we have an update and a cancel button. And they're not disabled by default. So there's an inconsistency between um, even two similar actions within two separate um, tools in Sakai. And this happens out throughout the system just because of what I talked about at the very beginning, just how Sakai has evolved over the years with all the different um, uh, contributions and the different pieces that have been put together to create Sakai. Going back to the assignments list, I want to also talk about the uh, the tabs that are across the top, starting with add and then the assignments list. Um, and compare that to the announcements list. Um, across the top uh, for assignments, we have the assignments list is the selected tab indicating that that's the page that we're on. So that's the current page. And if we look at that in announcements, we're on a page in announcements, but that page doesn't exist up at the top there. So it doesn't show us, um, it's not highlighting what the active tab is. So that's another inconsistency um, between the two tools. And so we find this throughout Sakai and um, there's been a lot of recent improvements over the last uh, few years, particularly the last few years, um, to help standardize parts of Sakai. And those include the date picker that's been um, standard, trying to be standardized throughout the, uh, the environment. Paging controls, similar paging controls throughout the environment. Uh, form fields, just the look and feel of those and how they operate. And then the Morpheus and the modern looking skin has put a lot of work into standardizing the look and feel and, and putting more usability um, results into the, um, the design of our, our product here. Um, but more work needs to be done, specifically with the tools, um, as I was just talking about with the assignments and the announcements tool, giving that um, example. So the solution for that would be to create a style guide or a design system that would be able to 
address some of those inconsistencies um, throughout the tools. And at this point, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jolie, who's going to talk about um, some of the work that um, she and Duke University has been working on. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, and so you saw an example earlier of a style guide from ages ago, version 1.2, um, and we know things have changed drastically in Sakai and, and dr drastically in terms of applications, UI. Um, we've got mobile, we've got um, just lots of changes. Uh, we've got Google's material design. Um, so, and Sean has done a great job of, of outlining some of the inconsistencies in Sakai. Um, and so the way to sort of address these inconsistencies is to um, create a new style guide and you, you need a process for that. Can you advance the slide or can I do it? Thanks. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about in a minute is our process for developing a new style guide. I met with my colleague, um, Barbara Puccio at, at Duke, and she helped us come up with a, a process for that. And I love this quote from Charles Eames, the details are not the details, they make the design. Um, because I think it, <laughs> it works well with our strategy, um, which I'm going to talk about in a minute here. Could you forward? Um, I just want to make everyone aware, because this can be hard to find, that we do have a confluence page on this that's going to outline some of these details if you want to go back to them. Um, you can go ahead and advance. And I'd like to talk about um, the process that's outlined on that um, confluence page. Um, it's the, the process that we're using for um, creating a new style guide is based on Brad Frost's um, atomic design methodology. And um, Brad Frost is a longtime developer and, and, and designer in, in the web community. And what he was saying in his work is that um, developers and designers have very different languages in the way they talk about how um, a UI of a product or a, a site is being built. And he, he, he saw this repeatedly, that there were just issues with this. And he, his goal was to try to come up with a common language that designers and developer, developers could both use um, around a UI and building that. And he, he, he built this design methodology. Um, and this is based on science. And it, it breaks the different pieces apart. So you have the atoms which is the smallest possible element on a page, a UI element. You have molecules, which kind of brings it together, a few, a few elements together, organisms, and even larger element. And then that all those things build up to um, templates and then full pages. Uh, you can advance because it will, we'll be able to give an example here. So here's an example of what that looks like when we talk about uh, the atoms and molecules and organisms. And this is taken from um, this is, looks like it's uh, Instagram. And so the atoms are those little pieces, the, each little design element, the home icon, the search, um, the heart, all of that, those little, every little piece, um, the, even the, the photo label, those are all the atoms. And you can bring those elements together to make molecules. And, and the molecule would be each one of those pieces that you see, the top element, which is um, the blue bar with the photo and the arrow and the refresh. And then the next one is another molecule that maybe has the name. Um, so all of those pieces are molecules, and then those continue to come together to be the organism. And then again, all of it together makes a template. Really just the layout in general, it's not, you know, the, um, the, the page as you would see it, which would actually have the image and have the, the name. It's just more of a um, a template for the page. And those are how the, all the pieces build up to um, a full page. And so to get there, to how do we get to the, this kind of um, very modular um, uh, way of thinking about our UI? And we do that with what's called a UI inventory. Um, and this is also something that Brad Frost came up with. He actually has his own templates for this. Um, and an example on his on his site, which I have right here. Um, so this is a sky a UI inventory is when you go through all of your application and you capture all the UI elements, uh, buttons, uh, labels, um, 
you know, navigation, all the pieces. Um, and, and then you bring it together like this so you can see the discrepancies. And this is actually his example from his bank. Um, this, is, this is an actual application out there, a professional application uh, that he used as an example of how it, UIs can be you know, very uh, inconsistent, even in, in everyday products that we use. Um, and what's, the reason I used this example actually is because um, it's more uh, obvious than, than Sakai. I could have probably pulled a bunch of things together from Sakai. Sean had some great examples earlier, but this is obviously um, a system that needs some work with consistency. So this is what we've been working on in the community. Um, can you advance to the next slide? Um, and one of the ways that we've been doing this is with a, a process very similar to what we do with QA. Um, Barbara and I, when we met last year, you know, she had never really used Sakai. I mean, she works at Duke, but she's you know in a completely different department, so the system was new to her. Um, so she's learned a lot about Sakai, um, but you know when we were talking about how we might achieve this, because all of this atomic design stuff and the, this process came from her, she, she was familiar with this and has done this previously here at Duke with, with other sites. Um, you know, I said, let's try to figure out a way that the community already knows how to work. Um, and one of those ways is with the QA process. Um, we had created spreadsheets that had a list of the tools and links out to you know other things that needed to be done like the um, regression scripts and things like that so we used that model right i stole one probably with a list of tools um, and then we created um, an inventory document for every tool um, and those inventory documents they're they're google slide decks and they're um, they have the tool name. they start with the tool name and then they go into each type of element that we want to um, try to capture within that tool. Um, things like navigation, buttons, things that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then you know, the, the example on the right here is kind of what one of those pages looks like. Um, you know, our, our application is different than a regular website because we have um, roles. And so this is an example on the right of the different roles um, that we might capture while we're doing our um, inventory because the student and the instructor see slightly different things because of their access. Um, so that has been the process and we've gotten really far. Um, I think you can uh, advance, thanks. Um, we've gotten really far with that piece and we're trying to finish up this month. Um, and you can, if you go to that project page in Confluence, there's a link out to that and you can see the work that's been done. Um, a huge shout out to Ben at Illinois, who's done a tremendous amount of work on that. Um, so the, the end goal of this UI inventory, once we once the inventory is complete, um, we go through and we compile, we start compiling by category and get all the buttons together, all the navigation, um, all the tables, all the elements that um, have been categorized in those ways. and I think the discrepancies will start to become obvious. Um, and so once we have that together, Barbara, my colleague, and her designers are going to use that to have some conversations with the community and come up with a proposed style guide. This will be in collaboration with the community. And, um, and then from there, we'll need to select a product to do um, the, the pattern library, which is how we, how we would track it. But let's talk about style guides for a minute. Um, and maybe some examples. Um, I th I'm sure that many of you have seen style guides. Um, you know, since I've been at a university, uh, the first style guide I remember seeing is when suddenly we realized that the university website was really important, and then all the academic websites that were being created that looked very different and that did not have the same branding, and then suddenly we had our uh, communications folks saying, hey, we created this guide, and here's how you will use the logo, and here are the colors that you will use. Um, and so most of us are familiar with it, I bet, in, from that perspective. Um, some examples that I have today are centered more around um, not just those types of elements, but also um, code plus uh, design elements and how those things work together. 
Um, I use this example because you know, this is sort of more comprehensive. This is this is the US web design standards. There's uh, a whole getting started area that there's a piece for developers, there's a piece for designers. Um, and some of these things even focus on um, specifically on accessibility. And so these are the kind of things that you can lay out for developers and designers who are working on your platform, on your system to say, you know, here, here's what we're expecting when you when you contribute to this or when you create something new. Here's your guide. Um, so I thought this was a really good example and very nicely done. I have a couple more examples. Um, this is an example with code um, and what it looks like. So if, it, if you have um, a UI that has cards, um, the piece on the left where it says Paris is how the card visually looks. The piece on the right is the code that goes with that. You can move to the next, yep. And so there are products in the community, um, when I say in the community, like there's products, uh, this is an open source product. I think this is um, Brad Frost product called Pattern Lab, and there are others that help you put together a style guide in this way. Um, and that's actually one of the things that we're working on right now is that we're, we're working, getting a list from our um, Duke Web Services. We have developers there who have experience with these products. Um, and we're in the process of looking at those to um, figure out what might be best for the community. So that's that's a step that's happening in in, in tandem with finishing um, finishing up the little pieces of the UI inventory that need to happen. Um, so that's also a next step um, because we're, since we're getting a bit closer to um, to a style guide, that's something that can happen simultaneously to that work, the style guide work. Um, so this is an example of one of those products. So, you know, this is a much, the UI inventory is, is a much, part of a much larger project, which is why I'm really glad that Sean has been able to work on this and, and others as well um, to be able to get involved because the UI inventory, we talk about that a lot, but it's really one piece of it. Um, there's the piece of figuring out where we are, which is the UI inventory. There's the style guide piece. There's the product piece, like how do we manage the, the style guide moving forward? We really need developers to be part of that conversation um, because that will very much affect their work. Um, so they need to um, have a say in that piece. And then even once we're even once we get there, even once we say, here's our style guide and here's where we're going to manage that. Um, beyond that is actually creating the consistency. Um, when we go, when we figure out where we're inconsistent, when we figure out what we want the design to be consistently, um, there'll be a piece after that of probably a farm project where we say, here's how much money we think it's going to take to do the development work to create these consistencies. You know who can who can fund that, and so we call this project that when we look at it holistically, we call it Switch. And Sean came up with this, which is great. Um, Sean, do you want to talk about this? Yes, at all? sure. Yeah, Switch has been a, an acronym that's been in my mind for quite a few years now, um, particularly with Sakai. Um, so Switch is like that, and uh, and. It, I, I've made it stand for the standardization within tools can happen. Originally, it was could happen, but now that we're working on it, it can happen. And it's essentially going back to what we've been talking about today, which is trying to provide consistency across the whole system. So rather than just consistency within a particular tool, but to have that consistency roll out throughout all the tools in Sakai. And the work that, uh, that uh, Jolie just mentioned, um, doing the inventory and getting the st style guide going. These are just kind of an outline of what we're thinking about doing right now, but um, these will have to be fleshed out a little bit more as the project progresses. But it's a switch is my hope for switch is to have it as a big project that will over uh, that will um, uh, be an overarching project over all of these uh, individual pieces of the the smaller projects like the inventory and then creating the style guide and then we'll have to make those changes in the product and and start creating that consistency. And then after we get it 
that the product consistent, then we have to have some sort of maintenance pro uh, pro process so that um, we keep it consistent. So we don't want this just to be an appoint in time effort because so much time has gone in just to getting the inventory. We want to make sure that um, there's adherence to it and that new contributions, so whether that's new to tools or just improvements on existing ones, that those also adhere to um, the defined consistency that we've created in this project. So um, that's that's kind of the switch project in, in a whole. Um, and so we are looking for people to help contribute um, to the different aspects. So if you're interested in anything that we've talked about, please feel free to contact Jolie and I, and uh, we'd be happy to, to work with you. Um, we're looking for people that have expertise in any of these areas, um, because we're kind of learning as we're going as well. Um, and uh, uh, Duca has been um, uh, amazing with, with the resources that Jolie has been able to um, work with them on and uh, contribute um, to the inventory project and we're really looking forward to continuing uh, the work with them and uh, with others so I think that's everything that we have for today um, about this um, if anyone we're, has any questions or we're in we're also in the process of um, kind of moving the UI inventory confluence page that I showed earlier um, to be under this the, the switch piece we're actually going to have a, a space in confluence that says switch and out outlines this kind of more holistically as we've been talking about it so people can kind of see you know the overarching part of it the whole process Great. can you paste the url to the confluence page for us into the chat jolie sure of course okay thank you that would be helpful and i'll also put it in the ether pad yeah, once we get that new space uh, in Confluence created, um, we'll be sending out an announcement um, to the list um, to, to introduce the project more widely. Um, I think um, we've done a few of these presentations over the last six months, but we, um, we'll communicate more on um, via email. Um, and we're also going to be presenting at the um, Sakai Virtual Conference as well um, with uh, uh, updates on the project. Awesome. As a Sarah's question was, where are we now in applying the new standard? So is there any uh, specific update about that that you could share? Well, we won't, we won't be able to apply new standards till we have new standards. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, you know. Well as, well, as an example, maybe this fits, Jolie, this is Laura Geckler. Maybe uh -huh. the, the um, the date picker example that that Sean that Sean had as a mm -hmm. emerging standard or as a you know we're trying to make it consistent across. Mm -hmm. Once it's consistent, as as you were saying, it's not a point in time; it's a continual process. And some people have already started saying, you know, did we pick the best one because this one only increments by five minutes instead of one minute and <laughs> other other sorts of things. So here we have a a standard that is in the process of being implemented while people are already looking for the one that will replace it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm just saying that uh, it's, a, it's a continuous thing, right? Once the, once the um, style guide says, use this date picker, uh, you know, in six months, they may say, no, we found this other date picker. And, and that's fine. I mean, you know, I, there will be changes, there will be iterations. Um, hopefully these will be based on user testing. Um, you know, usually designs are, I mean, design should be based on user feedback. And what's technically possible, those two things kind of go together. Um, so I, I don't, I do expect there to be um, changes, um, but, you know, I, I think I think one thing that the style guide will accomplish that maybe we haven't had in the past is a single place to go to to figure out what the standard is. You know, we don't have that documented anywhere. Um, it, yeah, we know that this date picker effort has been going on. There's maybe a confluence page somewhere. Maybe there's been discussion on lists that we can go back and refer to, but there's no single place for the community to go to and see 
oh, this is what we've decided on for now. Um, and here's how, what are, the, what are the expectations around this design and how this works in Sakai? Sure. I see Neil put in the, it put in the chat that uh, date picker is pretty much uh, finalized, done as, you know, as far as this iteration and making it consistent across the entire app. He reminded me that um, it, that was paid for with uh, Sakai virtual conference funds. So that's really cool. That's great. Yeah, that date picker wasn't uh, a part of the switch project. It, I just used it as an example to illustrate that um, some of these efforts were already going on prior to us forming this project, but uh, sure. that I, uh, I, we need to continue that. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I, I, this is important to us, right? I mean, I think we all have want to see um, consistency within Sakai and we know when those pain points happen because most of us work with faculty and we get this, we're, we're doing support so we know where the pain points are either because we're in Sakai all the time but also because we're hearing it from our users. Um, but I think what's really, what's really obvious to me is, you know, to see a new developer come into the community and say, where's your style guide? Like, I'm, I want to start something new or I want to, mm -hmm. I want to contribute to this where do I go to know what to do? Well, you know? with that, with that, Jolie, I, I wanted to ask the specific question whether um, in the past six months you and Sean have done any presentations for developers and what has their feedback been um, about this standard, this project? Um, well, not in the past six months, but um, when I think Sean was there at Sakai Camp in January at the beginning of the year. Barbara did this presentation, and there were a lot of developers in the room. Yep. Then. That's true. I was there too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and I don't remember. You know, my sense is that there was, you know, agreement that we want consistency in Sakai, and that um, uh, the UI inventory would reveal inconsistencies. I, I think the real um, unknown at this moment that would be that would affect developers the most is how we handle the style guide and you know if we have a product that that does that the products that I talked about a minute ago um, those are the things that will impact the developers the most um, and but in terms of you know conversations that I've had with developers and John you can speak to this too because I, I can only talk about what I've uh, experienced personally um, I, they're behind it and they think it's a good idea to create this consistency. For sure, yeah. Um, as as we get this developed, then once it's finished, we'll have a essentially a component um, buffet for them to choose from. So rather than having to reinvent the wheel every time they want to or think about it, they can just see what is, um, what the conventions are already and be able to use those in their um, designs and in their development. So it, it'll really streamline their process as well. Um, and speaking right. from the developer myself, um, but at the same time, there's going to be a lot of work on the part of the developers to get to that point because before we have everything consistent, we need to make it consistent. So there's gonna be a lot of work to do that and it isn't gonna be an easy task. It's not gonna be done by January or anything like that. It, it's gonna be a multi, multi-year project as, as we get this um, implemented and uh, decided. And I think even creating the style guide, there's gonna be a lot of discussion in the community as to, as we're finalizing those things. And that comes back to the point that you made earlier, Laura, about the date picker and stuff like that. Those types of conversations that we've had before it was chosen and that we'll have after something is decided on, um, we'll have to flesh out the, the details of that. Right, right. Well, I even think of, um, and maybe this has occurred to you, but I think of the the broader Aperio community. Perhaps it was because last last week or the week before I was reminded when we had a new member on the call who um, joined the Aperio teaching and learning call to talk about a non-Sakai um, issue with their teaching and learning experience. And we didn't have anybody uh, on the call at that time who could could uh, communicate or you know talk with him about that issue. But it reminded me, uh, and so does this presentation, of how timely this is for any Aperio uh, project that has any software that has any kind of UI, and especially the teaching and learning ones. If, um, if the other communities would like to learn and take a look at the kinds of things that we're initiating here with Sakai, um, maybe we can help reduce their pain by having paved the way before them. 
that's a that's a great idea, Laura. I, actually, we found out at our presentation in June that um, OpenCast is already using. Um, uh, they they already have something like what we're talking about. Um, they have really? a style guide. I just pasted it in, into the big blue button. Um, so I you know I think that there's folks that we should talk to um, when you know we're talking about potential products that we'll use to manage our style guide slash pattern library. We have they have sort of interchangeable names here, but um, yeah, I pasted it in there, and uh, someone for, who was in our presentation came up and said, "Hey, you know, have you seen this?" So um, I'm there now. It looks fabulous. That's yeah, really it does, cool. Doesn't it? Yeah. Did you get anything from them on what product they chose, or why, or how they did that? Not yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. John and Jolie, this. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's really uh, exciting that we're finally moving in this direction. And thank you so much for leading the charge um, to get us there. This is amazing. I'm looking forward to getting your email uh, that outlines a little bit, I assume, a little bit more of a plan to go forward. And um, uh, yeah, any last thoughts before we conclude? Oh, are we concluding? So we're not gonna do the QA thing? No, we are going to do that. We're concluding this part of it. Oh, okay. I thought you meant concluding the meeting because we're pretty, pretty tight. <laughs> Sorry, Neil. <laughs> well, I appreciate you having us and, and giving us the opportunity to, um, to present this. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the questions and the interest in it. And yeah, we're, we hope that the community will support the project and, and uh, that it will be successful. And uh, we'll keep you guys updated on the email list. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Neil, please uh, talk to us a little bit more about the QA effort for Sakai 12. Okay, um, and I am aware of the time. There's only five minutes left, and there's at least one other thing on the agenda. Are we just going to skip that thing? The discussion schedule? Uh, yeah, we have or? some uh, meetings coming up. We have some openings in December. If you guys have any thoughts, uh, would like to volunteer to present on anything, uh, please reach out to me or Matt Burgess or Neil Caden and we'll get you scheduled. So now I think you can take the rest of the time, Neil. Okay. Well, I'll try and be brief. Um, let's see. I'll paste in the, the link here. So as I mentioned earlier, we're ready to start ramping up on Sakai 12. Uh, QA, um, just for transparency's sake, there's some discussion around whether we want to get an 11.5 out. So you might see some messaging around that to try and figure that out. Um, and uh, that's a separate thing. Um, we have now a plan for the QA Maven. And the summary of that plan is that we are doing it tool by tool again. And we're hoping that it will be like an adopt a tool kind of thing where institutions would adopt a tool and coordinate the testing for that tool. And then other people who want to test on that tool don't you know, from other any place in the community would just check in with the lead from that institution so that they would so it can be coordinated and they can say, oh, please work on this or please work on that. And they can have that discussion of whether to use the regression scripts or create their own templates to do the testing. So that's kind of the high level. So we're going to uh, start recruiting uh, schools. We've already started recruiting, asking people if they're willing to take tools. For the more complex tools, um, you know, if a tool, if an institution takes a more complex tool, we don't want them to take more than one of those, right? And then it, it, because there's so many tools in Sakai, though, if you could take one or two simpler tools as well to knock it out. So we're hoping sort of a divide and conquer approach to this and also a lot of communication between the people who um, volunteer to coordinate testing on a tool and the QA group, which is, you know, a lot of it has been me and Didi and there's other folks involved as that uh, as well, but we've been um, leading the charge lately. And so that's that's the sum, high level summary of it. So if you could start thinking about, you know, take a look at the spreadsheet, um, start thinking about what tool you might, you know, especially of the complex tools and maybe some of the simpler tools you'd be willing to, to lead. Let me bring that up. And, um, and then we can kind of have that discussion and make sure we get everything divided up fairly. Uh, let me get the 
the link there, and then uh, there'll be more on the on the list as well. Uh, information. Thank you, Duke. And let me get the spreadsheet so you can see that as well from there. And the other thing that we're hoping to do sort of in parallel with this as you uh, you know, take a tool is we're hoping to, to move to a more sustainable model of QA testing, meaning the detailed test scripts have been really challenging to maintain, really challenging to use. You're welcome to use them. There's still a lot of value in them because they exist and there's way, they're a good way to structure testing. But we also want to think about how can we compress those into um, templates that are more human language and more about the thing you're trying to test rather than every step by step that you're trying you know, that you need to do to do that testing so that's something else we're wanting to have some discussion on and seeing if we can sort of um, um, evolve to a new model and we might even eventually use jira have its own qa project where we can then have a much easier way to track who's tested what by taking those templates uh, that we create during this process and, and putting them in there so that's kind of a 25,000 foot view of it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neil. And Welcome. thank you everyone for joining today. I really appreciate all the conversation and interest in uh, Jolie and Sean's presentation on the Switch project. And uh, look forward to seeing you next time. We'll be uh, hearing from Samantha Lee Pan at University of Cape Town, who will be talking about mobile apps in Sakai. So that should be pretty interesting as well. Look forward to seeing you all next time. Take care. Thank you.